Good morning. My name is Mark Sauner. I'm the director of the Institute for Science, Society and Policy. So very happy here to have this panel on science policy and science advice. And uh, the event will be opened by the Associate Vice Rector of Research, Professor, Vice President of Research, sorry, uh, Professor Ruby Heap. Good morning, everyone. Bienvenue à tout le monde. So, Mr. Drake, British High Commissioner to Canada. Uh, Mr. Willits, where is he sitting? Here you are, yes. UK Minister of State for University of Science, Professor Polyakov and Professor uh, Bounds are sitting just here as well. Colleagues and other members of the audience, it is an immense pleasure to welcome you all this morning on behalf of the University of Ottawa to what promises to be a very stimulating discussion devoted to the question, how does science advice shape and inform uh, government policy? This is certainly a fundamental question. Um, to quote my students and my daughter Susie, it is a hot question. Uh, which is generating considerable interest, not only in the UK, uh, as we know by the presence of our guests, but in Canada as well, and here also at the University of Ottawa, where you can find a growing pool of reputed scholars with a strong expertise in issues related to science and society, science policy, governance and innovation, both on the national and international fronts. And these uh, scholars are coming from all disciplines, from the arts to science and engineering to law and so forth and so forth. Several of them are here present today. Uh, they all contribute very actively to our interdisciplinary research and institutes that are interested in all these issues that I just mentioned, such as the Institute for Science Society and policy, uh, commonly known as the ISSP, uh, which is affiliated to the Faculty of Arts, and we have the Dean of the Faculty of Arts here, uh, Tony Lechowitz, welcome Tony, and also the Center for International Policy uh, Studies, known as SIPS, which is affiliated to the Faculty of Social Sciences. Now, both of these uh, center and institute are sponsoring today's event, in collaboration with the British uh, High Commission. Now this kind of very important collaboration leads me to my second remark, which pertains to the key role played by the national capital in fostering the mutual exchanges of ideas and of expertise uh, between university researchers, uh, members of government and non-governmental agencies, representatives from our embassies and from other international organizations, from community leaders, and uh, so forth. And there are some uh, of these uh, leaders who are here present today in organizations. I just want to mention the, president, the uh, presence of uh, Gilles Patry, president of the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. And I saw Eleanor Fast also, who works for the Federation of the Humanities and Social Sciences. And if I can make just a pitch, is that the Federation will be hosting in 2015 at the University of Ottawa its next uh, Congress. And uh, I'm throwing right away the invitation to all of you to participate, and we'll get back to you on this uh, fairly soon. Now, all of us benefit highly from events such as the one we are attending today. But I'm especially thinking of our students, who you will agree with me, are in a win-win situation when they're offered this great opportunity to hear and discuss the views of great guests, such as those we're welcoming uh, today. I will end by expressing my most sincere thanks to Nicole Arbeau, Science and Innovation Officer at the British High Commission, to Max Saner, Director of the ISSP, and to Roland Parry, Director of SIPS, for making this event uh, happen. I, I must say, I remember Nicole's first visit to the office of the Vice President of Research. I was there with Mona Niemer, and uh, 
she was there, she had the agenda, and since then she's been doing great things at, uh, in Ottawa, including, and especially I would say, with the University of Ottawa. So thank you and congratulations, Nicole. I, I wanted to mention your, your great efforts and success in uh, making these uh, bridges between academia and the British High Commission. So merci beaucoup à vous trois, bravo. And I will now invite Mr. Drake to take over and continue with the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and, and good morning. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. I will keep this short so that we can have keep the discussion uh, open and get started. Uh, I just want to say very briefly, first of all, thank you to the university. It's great to be here. Um, it really is uh, a terrific pleasure for us. And uh, I've noted the commercial about Nicole's contribution. Um, uh, secondly, it's a particular pleasure for me as the High Commissioner to be able to welcome uh, Mr. Willits, David Willits, who is our Minister of Universities and Science to, uh, to Canada, and indeed our distinguished colleagues on the delegation, um, Mary Bounds, who's Senior Vice Principal of Edinburgh and Martin Polyakov, who has the great title of Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society. Um, just very briefly, the, the, the whole idea of science and innovation collaboration is very important to, uh, to my government uh, here in Canada. We ha Nicole heads up a team we have around the country. And the framework in which we do this, I think it's very important to, to do a little plug here. Um, as you know, the UK and Canada are very close friends. We go back a very long way, uh, and we see a lot of things the same way. And in fact, we had, as you know, our Prime Minister was here a couple of years ago, and he and your Prime Minister signed a joint declaration covering all sorts of expanded collaboration in all sorts of areas. And in fact, uh, I'm actually off to London tonight because your, your Foreign Minister and my boss, William Hague, are, are doing another statement of commitment for a new uh, helping of, of such collaboration. But one important part of that, when that was uh, uh, conceived, was to, down the line, boost the, the science and innovation uh, agenda between the two countries, and it led to a, a joint innovation statement. Now, this sounds like all the sorts of declarations and things that people like me get paid to do, but it is actually really substantive, and it's leading to some really active partnerships and so on. So I pay tribute to Nicole, myself, and her team around our country for doing that. But it really is an important uh, uh, thing for us and an important context. And of course, uh, I think today's uh, agenda is, is particularly interesting, the topic, because you know, how, how science policy Relate, or how science advice relates to, to government policy. We had, as some of you may know, the, uh, the British government's chief scientific advisor here in, uh, at, at the end of last year. So uh, this is, uh, if you like, a sort of a, a further adjunct to that, although a much more important one, Minister. Um, and uh, it's really good. And I think the, the key thing, as I've learned, I've not been in Canada very long, but uh, what I am very clear on is we can, as very old friends, we can learn from each other uh, and speak very openly in so doing. So uh, thank you very much uh, for having us. It's a great pleasure. Minister, thank you again for, for coming out here. It's great to have the Minister for Science here in Canada. And I will, without, I think, further ado, now uh, hand over to the Minister and invite him to uh, 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 address us all with some remarks and get the conversation going. But thank you very much again for having us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, High Commissioner, and it's great to be here. I'm grateful to the University of uh, Ottawa and SIPS, your institute, for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk, really, just to define our terms. I think what we're talking about today is science for policy, not policy for science. Perhaps in the questions we may range into policy for science, but I'm going to try, in my remarks, to, to focus on science for policy. And let me begin by explaining where I fit in as the Minister for Universities and Science. And let me level with you, I am not a scientist. Uh, I greatly appreciate the tolerance of the scientific community in that uh, they have a Minister for Science who's not a scientist. I have to say sometimes scientific expertise does get in the way. When we have, I was trying to give you, I'm gonna try to give you some examples as we go through. When in sitting around in the EU Council, we're discussing the problems of ITA, the, the great um, nuclear fusion project. If 
some of the science ministers in the EU are lay people like me, others are real experts, and a science minister who chips in and says, I'm not at all sure about the tokamak model of nuclear fusion. I've always thought that laser-based fusion is a better way forward. That kind of misses the point, and we all have to wait while the expert makes these comments, and then get back to the problem that we've got an international project whose costs are out of <laughs> control. So, the, um, so sometimes, with the greatest respect, the, the science ministers who are themselves scientists can sometimes allow their particular expertise in some particular area to get in the way. Uh, for me, one of the challenges I notice and set for the scientist community is to explain what they're doing for me as a layman. And you do discover extraordinary diversity from some who are absolutely brilliant at communicating what they're doing to a lay, lay person like me and others who do find it hard to explain what they're up to. I am occasionally... I am occasionally sort of treated as if I should be an expert. We have a programme called Newsnight uh, on BBC Two, presented by a formidable interviewer called Jeremy Paxman, who some of you may have heard of. And I remember I was there doing an interview on a different subject, on fairness between the generations, which I've written about. And he said to me, Mr Willis, you don't mind staying on. We've got a little film report uh, from CERN, from the Large Hadron Collider. You'll be interested in that. So I sat lounging in my interviewee's chair as he showed the film clip. Then he turned to me and said, so, Mr Willits, what is the Higgs boson? <laughs> uh, and I said, well, you know, you need... <laughs> You need Brian Cox on to describe to you what the Higgs boson And then he said with a note of threat in his voice, Mr. Willits, you are the science minister. What is the Higgs boson? We were live on air, I should add. We were live on air. And the, uh, I managed to get... I was in danger of being an internet, a YouTube sensation. Um, and I managed to struggle through it and offer an account which was... Uh, just about credible. It was almost as bad as the time when I was doing a live interview for Sky after I'd announced that we were going to invest in reaction engines, which is a new um, air-breathing rocket engine. And two minutes before we went on air, Sky said, we thought we might begin by asking you to explain how it works. So there are, and there are challenges when occasionally people assume you should be an expert, but I try not to be. And but what I do hope I am, and what I do, of the crucial value that I share with the scientific community, I hope I am an empiricist who believes in evidence and evidence shaping what we do. And fortunately, one of the reasons why science in Britain is very good is that the, we have what's called the Haldane Principle, which says that it is not the job of the science minister to decide between specific projects. Those are determined, those crucial judgments about exactly what should be financed, who should get the Research Council grant, which universities should get more research funding, are not determined by politicians or the science minister. They're determined by the science community within a framework that we set. And I think that is the right way to do things. Um, as this, I am fortunate uh, in that although our department, the business department where I'm located, has its Secretary of State, Vince Cable, from a different political party. I get on very well with Vince. Don't mind being quoted on that. Get on very well with Vince. Um, I also have a place in the Cabinet as the Minister for Universities and Science. That does mean that I can chip in from, in all the discussions we have. And again, the other week, we were discussing flooding. We have a serious problem of flooding in Britain at the moment. And, and I thought the obvious point was not being made. So I said... Now, the what the scientists say to me, and again, I'm the layman, so I can report it on in a way that I hope my colleagues would get, is that what climate change has done is it's, it's put the weather on steroids. There is more energy in the atmosphere. There is more energy in the oceans. That means we are mo more prone to extreme weather events. Um, and you can try to chip in from the science perspective when these things are being discussed. So that's where I fit in. Alongside me, there is the chief scientist. We've had a chief scientist in Britain since 1964. We're about to celebrate the 50th anniversary. Uh, it was earlier on in my time as minister, it was Sir John Beddington. It's now Sir Mark Walpert. Uh, both of them people with whom I had an excellent working relationship. They do not work for me. In fact, they directly report to the prime minister, but they're located in uh, my department. They're in the same building, and anything that they send into the Prime Minister, they would copy to me and quite possibly discuss or inform with me in advance. Um, and uh, when they, if there is something where a proper expert scientific input is required, they will be invited to come to 
uh, cabinet to report to us or to one of our cabinet committees. So, for example, during the Fukushima crisis, when we needed to know exactly what advice should be given to diplomats and tourists and British people living in Japan and how serious it was, for several of those cabinets, John Beddington came to present on our latest assessment of the significance of Fukushima. And interestingly, on the basis of that advice from John Beddington and the scientists, we did not advise that our embassy staff or uh, visitors living in Tokyo should leave Tokyo. Our assessment, our objective assessment, was that the danger was not so great they should leave Tokyo. And the Japanese government are very aware of the governments which pulled their staff out and the governments which did not pull their staff out. And, uh, in, and the experience of our acting on independent advice from the chief scientist is one of the reasons why now the Japanese government are interested in creating something like that chief scientific advisor post for them. Uh, we have an emergence, one of the subcommittees of, of cabinet is COBRA, which is the, the civil contingencies, emergency planning staff, and the chief scientist will be brought into those discussions and indeed can chair his own group called SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, when you do need a serious scientific input. And that was activated, for example, during the H1N1 influenza pandemic in 2009, or more recently, the Icelandic mm -hmm. volcano eruption with the ash clouds, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it. So we can draw on scientific advice from the chief science advisor as an independent uh, voice. Uh, I will often work with the Chief Science Advisor on areas where we, where we both need to communicate. So last Friday, uh, we did a joint press conference at the Science Media Centre, which is an independent uh, host for science media briefings, on the use of animals in research. The coalition has got a commitment to work to reduce the use of animals in research. So uh, I was there to explain what we are doing to deliver on that in policy terms and the extra funding we are putting into the reduction, uh, refinement, replacement of animals wherever possible. Sir Mark Wolpert was there to give some really powerful independent science evidence as to how there are circumstances when however high your standards and whatever you do, you are going to need to use animals in research. And he was able to say, if we're to tackle Alzheimer's, if we're to research antibiotic resistance, you do need uh, the use of animals, often now mice or fish. And indeed, you can also, especially using um, genetic uh, uh, techniques, you may be able to use mice in future for tests that were done on higher order animals in the past. And when we're talking to, say, the Chinese about their requirements that cosmetics be tested on animals, when we in the UK do not permit the testing of cosmetics on animals, and indeed that's now the position across the EU. And it's better if it's not politicians having this argument, it is scientists from the UK, science advisors, explaining the steps that we've taken and why we don't believe that that is necessary. Uh, the chief scientist also and his office also run foresight exercises when they try to do long-term assessments of uh, of issues coming up on the horizon, advanced manufacturing. They're currently doing one on a topic I've just been uh, speaking at as another seminar, smart cities, how smart cities are changing. Alongside the chief scientist and his office located, as I say, in, in my department, though not under direct control of the ministers in my department, there is a network of chief science advisors in every department. Some of them are outside appointments brought in because it's a department that has a large amount of engagement with science, uh, the, uh, the DEFRA, the Environment and Agriculture Department, or the MOD. <coughs> Sometimes if it's a department that has less direct involvement in, in uh, science issues, it'll be an internal appointment that someone with a scientific background who has the post of chief science advisor within that department. Um, they can uh, their influence varies depending often on the amount of science that the department deals with. And one thing I can do is nudge one of my colleagues around the cabinet table to make sure if I think there is some useful science 
the advice coming in or some science work that's happening that they need to be aware of, encouraging them to hear from their own chief scientists. And the network of scientists headed by the chief scientists meet together once a week over breakfast to compare notes compare notes on what's happening, pool information, and I'm sure provide mutual support when they're talking about the things that we politicians get up to sometimes. So there is a good network there. Uh, I'm trying to take you through the structure as quickly as I can. So there's the Minister for Science, there is the Chief Science, and a network of science advisors in every, uh, chief scientists in every department. Then, as you sort of carry on through the penumbra, there are scientific, science advisory committees, who are groups of expert scientists, maybe now not on the staff of departments, ex outside experts working in universities or research institutes who give advice on tricky and delicate issues. And they can get caught up in very tricky issues. Um, uh, drugs, for example, and the debate about the legalization or otherwise of drugs which Professor David Nutt, famous, a, a case that he famously got involved in, known in the trade as the Nutt case. Um, and uh, he, in many ways, led, it happened under the previous government, um, and he was entitled to his views on uh, drugs. He, he absolutely was. I think what everybody learned from that episode is that people hadn't quite worked out what you could say if you were also advising the government and in some sense had a privileged position as an official advisor to the government. And we've now got a document, a fuller document than ever before, principles of scientific advice to government, which makes it clear that you have an absolute right to advise ministers as frank, uh, frankly and honestly on exactly your assessment. But equally, in return, you need, for the place at the table, you need to respect that ministers have the ultimate right to decide, balancing the points you make with other points, which includes just as we're democratically elected, what we think is acceptable and part of the culture and values of the society around us and the people who elect us. And what we have now done uh, under this government is that we have strengthened the a parallel document for ministers, questions of procedure for ministers, which are basically the rules which ministers have to comply with as we do our job and lots of rules about a whole range of subjects. And that now, more explicitly than ever before, says that we have to have regard to uh, the advice that we get from the uh, scientific community and the science advisory committees. So that's how the structure works within government on the, per on the per number of government. Very briefly, just to finish it off with um, the more... Uh, uh, external bodies. We have a Council for Science and Technology, which is co-chaired by the chief scientist and an outsider, currently Nancy Rothwell, the vice-chancellor of the University of Manchester, which brings together outside experts, vice-chancellors of universities, leading researchers and scientists. And they, it's a fantastic resource for us because essentially they advise the government, they choose topics where they think we need to get uh, further advice, and they write letters to the Prime Minister on these topics, which they choose. I might sometimes say to them, this is a hot topic, have you got anything to say? Other times they will just choose for themselves something they think we need to focus on. They'll write to the Prime Minister, copy to me, the letter will then be put up on the website. Recent subjects um, have been algorithms, just exactly what our comparative advantage is in the UK, what more we can do on IT and software, um, the teaching of science in schools, uh, medical education, uh, smart grids and how we take the opportunity of smart grids and what the technologies are around smart grids. Very useful and we're incredibly fortunate to have essentially these people giving their time and expertise and producing advice in a form that a lay person can understand. And they will have a, a meeting with the Prime Minister once a year and meetings with others of us during the year. Within Parliament, there is POST, the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology, um, which provides advice for MPs. In some ways, it's the parallel structure. If you think of the chief scientist and his structure is giving advice to the executive, POST is what gives advice to the legislature. Uh, and I would say of the various activities they engage in, the two that really um, I would probably rank most highly are, first of all, what they call post notes, which are, again, accounts for lay people, accounts for busy MPs, 
when there's a topic which is part of political debate on uh, trying to make sense of it for a layman, taking them through the issues. Um, and as well as that, and this really helps the science community because much though I respect, indeed love the science community, just occasionally scientists are a bit naive about public policy and the trade-offs that you make in public policy. So just as we in public policy have to understand and respect uh, scientists, so scientists, I think, um, sometimes have to understand the constraints and the, uh, and the way in which public policy has to be formulated. And there is a program of fellowships for sci people doing science PhDs in our universities who in their second or third year can spend six months in post and they can be writing briefs and seeing politics in its wildest, reddest, bloodiest form in the House of Commons. And I'm sure it's very good for them and they enjoy going back to the laboratory afterwards. So <laughs> the, uh, we have fellowships for students, uh, deep doctoral students at post. And then finally, and this is the right point to end because I'm very uh, pleased that I've got uh, with me in my delegation, Mary from the University of Edinburgh um, and uh, uh, as well as that, uh, the senior vice principal of the University of Edinburgh, and Martin, Martin Polyakov from the Royal Society. We have good uh, links with our learned societies and universities. And the Royal Society, for example, produces um, excellent work. I think, for example, of a document now that came out in 2012, Science as an Open Enterprise, which is a really serious piece of work that has had a big impact on the way we approach issues like open access to research findings, the open data agenda. Um, and we would uh, informally or formally consult our learned societies uh, on uh, major policy issues certainly affecting science, but ranging more widely. There are, and that, as well as the Royal Society, there's the British Academy, more on the humanities and social sciences side. There's the Academy of Medical Sciences, the Royal Academy of Engineering. So there are four in all, but the Royal Society is the kind of the, the oldest uh, of the lot. Um, and I would encourage, and I do try to encourage the, the Royal Society to make sure that the scientific voice is heard as much as possible on the hot topics of the day, on GM or climate change, because there is sometimes a temptation for those debates to be shaped by our views of the policy consequences rather than what the scientific evidence says. So we've got a, and when we had the G8 Science Summit last summer, it was great for it to be held at the Royal Society, co-chaired with myself and Professor Sir Paul Nurse, the president of the Royal Society. So we work with our learning societies and, are, and they have absolutely the right to uh, speak up independently. They're independent and historic organizations. So that's our ecosystem for um, uh, science for policy. Nothing is perfect. Every country will have their own way of doing things. There are different models around the world. There is no one right way of doing it. As I go around the world, I observe lots of different models. Ours is still changing and developing. But I think it has ensured that the voice of scientific evidence is properly heard at the heart of government as it should be. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
is a senior vice principal and professor of development biology at the University of Edinburgh, and she has the strategic responsibility for external engagement. She also leads the Edinburgh, Edinburgh Beltane, a public engagement initiative on behalf of all the universities in Edinburgh, which encourages researchers to engage with the public and policymakers. So uh, she obviously has a, a lot of experience in bridging out of the science context into the world of policy and policy advice. And uh, the same could be said for our other guest, Professor Martin Polakiov, who started, has a long and distinguished career starting uh, in Cambridge and is probably best known now as the Foreign Secretary and Vice President of the Royal Society, appointed 2011 to 2016. So the Royal Society is the oldest uh, scientific society in the world, founded in 1660. It has uh, 1,450 very distinguished members. And uh, I do believe uh, it's probably one of the most admired organizations of its kind. Final point. Uh, Professor Polakiov, uh, his research interests are on supercritical fluids, continuous reactions and their applications to green chemistry. And he is a presenter at the highly successful YouTube chemistry channel, the periodic table of videos. So please have a look at these um, documents. And I would just like to invite you, though, maybe starting with uh, Professor Bounds, to provide a few reactions to... Uh, to either the speech directly or the issue of science advice in government. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me here um, at this meeting and the Minister for and allowing me to come. So I think I'd like to respond by saying, I don't think this is on. Okay, I'll stand up. Oh, I can give you, all right, that's okay. <laughs> okay, we can, we can cope, we'll do it this way. Um, so what I wanted to do was take a few minutes to say how the scientific community needs to respond to the challenge of ensuring that we get evidence-based policy. And in general, scientists are not comfortable with this. They're comfortable with working in their laboratories or whatever they're doing and doing their research and writing papers and speaking to each other. They're not... Um, they, it doesn't always come naturally to them to engage with the wider public or with um, the policy makers. And I think there's a culture change been going on in the UK about exactly how you can begin to change this. And I want to just tell you a little bit about one project which was called the Beacons for Public Engagement. And there was um, the research councils together with the Wellcome Trust and with the Higher Education Funding Council for England, the Scottish Funding Council and the Welsh Funding Council, put, them, put a project together where all, any university across the UK could bid to become a beacon of public engagement. And you had to put together a business case, if you like, for what you would do to get better public engagement for your area. And there were to be six of these across the whole of the UK. And the one that I put together for Edinburgh was for all of the Edinburgh universities to work together. Um, and a number of organisations that are much better at being public facing than the universities are. So we went in together with Dynamic Earth, which is a science centre, the museum, the Botanic Gardens, um, and a whole group of people across Edinburgh who know how to face the public. And we also thought that we've got also, we're in an unusual position in that we have a devolved system in that we've got a Scottish Parliament as well covering some things. So we felt that what we wanted to set up, so the theme of our beacon, if you like, was that we would have the university on one side the parliament on the other and the general public and the community as the third part. And what we wanted to do was work with the general public to um, interact and engage with them about what was going on in science 
but equally to make them feel more confident about decision making, about what they thought was good policy and what they thought was not going to be good policy, and to understand the implications of scientific advancement, which affects so many people's lives. Um, and then we would engage with the parliament directly and the policy makers to try to, um, so there would be some direct action and some action via the community. And we were very pleased that we got the funding for this. As with much of this funding, it was a project for four years and then we were told that the, there would be a cliff edge, there would be no more. So it had to be embedded at the end of it. Um, but I do think that um, having all the research councils join with the funding bodies for the universities to say, we want this kind of change is very important. Um, and I want to say that the other thing we did was that our project was not just scientists. Because if you want to see how a new development in science is going to impact upon people's lives, you actually need there other kind of researchers. You need the social scientists there. You need people who understand about policy and government. You need people who um, just work in completely different fields. Just as an example, when we were going out talking to people about stem cells and what they thought about stem cells and the use of them, there are not clear answers. There are quite big cultural differences in how people will respond. So we went not just with the scientists to explain what could and couldn't be done and what the potential benefits were, but also the potential risks. We would also take somebody that knew about ethics and somebody who knew about law and the legal issues. And this, and also usually a medic who would talk about the medical potential and the medical risks. And so you can't just go with your scientists if you want to engage the public. You have to go in a much broader way. And that actually encouraged within the university a lot of barriers to be broken down between the disciplines, which I think makes things much better. Um, so what do we actually do? Um, most, a lot of what we do is about training, de-jargonizing our scientists, if you like, and trying to get them to see, because of the research they're doing and what, where they need to work with the public, it depends exactly what you're doing, what your public is, and what the right venue is, and what the right event is. Sometimes it might be better to go to a very small community event. Sometimes a public lecture is fine, but a lot of the time it isn't. Um, people need to be in an environment that makes them comfortable. So sometimes they're happy coming to the university, and sometimes you really need to go to them into the environment that they're happy with. So it's really working with scientists to get them to do the right thing with the right people in the right place. Um, I think I would just make one response about Peter Higgs. And Peter Higgs, as you know, we're, we're all extremely excited that he got the Nobel Prize. And we were having an event at the university in McEwen Hall, which is a huge venue for the public, which was an audience with Peter Higgs. And we thought, well, actually, we can't let Peter just stand up and tell everybody about the Higgs boson, because uh, it's not really going to work. So what we had was Peter Higgs, and we had some of our colleagues who have been doing public engagement around particle physics for quite a long time. And we had a really fantastic event with the people who are really good at public engagement, Peter telling his story from how he discovered things, the science communicators explaining what it was all about, and then actually it finished up with some of our PhD students and early career researchers who'd been at CERN and who made the discovery. And so then you can have a really great event which lets the wider public engage with the Higgs pose boson and these discoveries, and actually was pretty good at explaining why CERN costs so much money. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that's probably all I want to say, but um, to say that there is a big culture change going on and there's different ways of doing it. I should finish by saying we did agree at the beginning we would find a way of embedding this project in the universities. It is embedded. We now have everything that we had before in Edinburgh with each of the universities in the city 
paying their share of keeping it going in proportion to the number of researchers they have. So, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bonjour. I'm uh, Martin Pollock. Of, I'm a chemist, as you can see from my tie. Um, I'm professor at the University of Nottingham, the home of Robin Hood, Robin de Bois. And I'm, um, I've been Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society for just over two years. And I'm delighted that Jeremy McNeil, the Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society of Canada, is in the audience over there. Perhaps you wave, Jeremy. And, um, the Royal Society, I must actually correct our chair, it is not the oldest Academy of Sciences in the world. It is the oldest, now listen carefully, continuously operating National Academy of Sciences. If you put in those extra words, what he said was true. And um, it was founded in 1660. It represents not only scientists in the UK, but also across the British Commonwealth. We have quite a large number of fellows here in Canada, not only in Ottawa, but also in Toronto, Quebec, and also in Calgary, and, I, I, and other cities as well. And um, so my role is as one of the vice presidents and to <coughs> work internationally. Our president, is a member of the Committee for Science and Technology that um, David Willits mentioned. And we have been advising the British government for a long time. This year is the 350th anniversary of our first report, which had a Latin name. It was called Silva, which means tree, or is it forest? You, you ought to know, you have a classical education. And it was about the sustainability of British forests. And I think it's quite interesting that even 350 years ago, people were worried about sustainability. In that case, it was whether there would be enough wood for building ships. So it shows already the, um, also the involvement of defense and various other aspects. Um, we um, have a, a science policy center with around 30 people working on it, which part of its role is to provide science-based <coughs> evidence to government for policy making. This is not necessarily to say what policies should be carried out, but to give people like David the information so that he can be informed by science when he makes a decision. So we've had recent reports, he mentioned science as an open enterprise which was not just about open access, but how we keep the conserve the huge amounts of data that we are collecting for future um, generations. There are wonderful examples. The, the, UK, the King William the Conqueror commissioned a doomsday book in 1086, cataloging the whole of the UK, which you can still read in the British Library. In 1986, the, Brit the BBC commissioned a new doomsday book, which was a laser disc, and now nobody can read it at all. <laughs> and so this is a problem that is facing us all across science. We had other reports, which would be of interest particularly to here in Canada on fracking, but in the UK context. And we have a lot of collaboration internationally. This is particularly my area, not only with the European Union through a variety of umbrella organizations such as ESAC, the European Academy of Sciences Advisory Council, but also across the world with the Inter-Academy Panel. Jeremy, my Canadian opposite number, is on the um, Council of IAP. And so we try and interact as much as we can because many of the challenges facing us now are global rather than um, national. And at the moment, we're working on reports, um, one on cyber security, another one on human resilience to climate change. And the third project, which I think is particularly important, which is called the Vision Project, which is what will 
education in science, technology, engineering, and maths in schools look like in 30 years' time? I don't know what the situation is in Canada, but in the UK, everybody's worrying about how the exams should be changed in one or two years' time. Nobody's looking at what we want, apart from the Royal Society, what we want in 30 years' time, how science education should change. And that's due to be launched later this year. So finally, what I would like to say is that we work closely with government, but we're independent of it. Uh, and also, <coughs> finally, to point out that through my work on YouTube, I have been amazed by the number of members of public all over the world who are interested in science. And so it is important for scientists to realize that there's much more interest out there from non-scientists in their subject, and I think our minister is a particularly good example of this. Thank you. Thank you. So many thanks for these comments. Uh, I have just a couple of questions for the, for the uh, panel here, and I would like to start with a warm-up question. And that is what we actually, I mean, you have to appreciate I come from the Faculty of Arts here. Uh, what do we really mean when we say the word science? Because there are science advisors, they are, they're talking about science advice, and topical in Canada, we just have um, a motion on the table in the House of Commons to create a parliamentary science officer. It's always that word science. So what's included? Is it the natural sciences only, or do we include administrative sciences, cognitive science, social science, political science, and so forth. I think it's important that we just get it out of the way, but maybe briefly, if possible. Well, there are, there are different meanings. When I, the Royal Society and its uh, science uh, tends to be on the physical and natural sciences. The British Academy tends to do the, uh, cover more the arts and humanities and social sciences. Uh, but when in the British government we talk about the science ring fence, which is the budget for science, uh, that includes the work of all seven of our research councils, stretching from the Natural Environment Research Council, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, through to the Social Sciences Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So uh, for the purposes of the, the science budget, it includes funding going via the Arts and Humanities Research Council to someone who's doing work on French existentialism or medieval music. Uh, and the interconnections between these different disciplines matter so much that I think it is good to think of the research base as covering all of them. And it relates to our public policy interest because often a lot of these issues end up involving human behavior. And one of the things you notice is sometimes people in the physical sciences, they'll, they will <coughs> design a new drug and then the aid budget will deliver it to East Africa. And you'll discover in East Africa, people think this is a Western plot to unman their tribal elders and nobody should take the drug. And suddenly, to get the actual human behavior that you want, the drug to be taken, you need anthropologists, you need people who understand the culture of the area, you need people who understand attitudes to the West in Africa. So very rarely is there a problem that can be solved simply through the lens of one discipline. Please go ahead, yeah. Well, I think I, I would certainly agree with that. I think that um, it, it, it does cover all the sciences and all of the different disciplines, and that's very clear in the UK. And I think it's also very clear that we all have to work together to engage with the public. The public doesn't see disciplines in, in little boxes the way we do in um, tr traditionally, if you like, in the universities. And so they don't distinguish between the social science and, and the actual discovery. And I think that getting researchers to work together more is one of the ways of overcoming these kind of issues and actually listening to the public, listening to people trying to say what it is they are worried about and responding with the right kind of discipline so that people can understand more 
what is and what can and what can't be done or what the risks are and what they aren't. So I, I would agree that I would have it cover all research councils. So um, I think that I'm not sure I agree with the purpose of your question because I think as a practicing chemist, I don't really differentiate between the people. There are either those who are doing research to find things out or there are other people. And scientist is a, quite a modern term. It was only coined in, I think, 1832, the year my grandfather was born, at the British Association when they suddenly decided they should have a term um, to describe people working in science like they have artists to describe those working in arts. And there was a lot of argument. People said scientist was an ugly word and they didn't like it. So I think what the, the thing which is perhaps unfortunate about the word scientist and science is that sometimes it is taken divisively not to involve engineers or technologists. And in fact, with modern problems, one needs everybody. And even then we may not solve them. So we shouldn't be arguing about, are you a scientist or you are whatever, but we should get on and solve the problems. Let's move to uh, something more practical. Uh, one, of the, one of the structures that Minister Willits mentioned, the uh, UK Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology post is uh, something, is a structure and its products that is in Canada often uh, looked at and we, we have had discussions over years uh, to what extent Canada could adopt uh, this kind of uh, structure and service. And I should maybe just read to you when uh, the official opposition critic for science and technology, Kennedy Stewart, moved um, Bill C-558 on December the 3rd. He was asking for a parliamentary science officer. On his website, he uses the word science watchdog. Uh, but the, when it comes to actually describing what it is, he does mention that one of the models would be post. So I'm, I'm just curious what Canada could learn from 20, I'm just looked up, we have 25 years of post notes going back to 1989. Uh, there's probably a longer development to discuss. What can you tell us, what could we learn in Canada from the way post has been created, has developed, is working now? What would you say is a few lessons learned? Well, well first of all, um, each country must make their own arrangements, and I'm uh, very happy to describe our arrangements and indeed our imperfections, but it doesn't mean that I think it wouldn't be right to uh, come here and uh, advise on a system that I don't uh, properly understand. You will make your own arrangements in Canada. Um, I don't think POST is a watchdog, however. What, what POST does, as I said, it really is aimed at providing information and resource for MPs so that if there is a debate in the House of Commons on advances in human fertilization or um, nuclear power or whatever, there is some kind of basis of agreed fact and analysis for a lay audience. Um, but that is, their, that is their function, providing that kind of information and advice for, minister, uh, for, sorry, for MPs. Uh, I wouldn't call them a watchdog, but it's, of course, each individual country to decide what kind of powers they would want in those circumstances. Anyone, any other comments on the lessons learned from the, those years? Um, so, well, I think perhaps what, what one thing that's quite interesting, the post is not very well known among the scientific community, but I'd really like to ask you a question, which is, how many of your members of the House of Commons are actually scientists? Because I can tell you in the UK, there is one PhD scientist out of 630-odd um, members of Parliament. Therefore, one cannot assume an enormously high level of scientific knowledge among our members of Parliament. Good. Yeah. Let me just uh, challenge you a little bit on that. I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to discuss what we mean by science advice 
was precisely to, the, to get to that point. So if we maintain that people in, with uh, education in engineering, medicine, or perhaps political science, or cognitive science, or maybe even administrative sciences, if they're all really scientists, then why do you end up with only one in the entire parliament? So, but I mean by that, that one person who's actually been involved in scientific research. I don't know what the number with PhDs are, but perhaps David knows that. There's about, it's about 70, just over 70 MPs who have studied science at university level. Uh, and that figure has been fairly constant for the last decade or more, <coughs> out of 650 MPs. Would you like to comment on the issue? Um, I'm not really quite sure what to comment on the issue, but I do think I understand what you're what you're saying, and I think that having an evidence-based approach to research is very valuable for informing policy. So I think it is the research process that's very useful, but for some things, you actually need the discipline knowledge as well to know whether a new discovery, what the potential of it is, and whether that's in um, data analysis and what your computer will and won't do, or whether it's in medicine and a new treatment for a disease, um, or whether it's in chemistry. You need the experts who really understand what's possible along with those who understand how to get best evidence from research, and that will go beyond the disciplines. So okay. I think it's a mixture. Thank you.